Now that we know implicit differentiation, let's take a look at our logarithmic functions because we already know the derivatives of our exponential functions. I have them up here um, on the screen right now. Exponential functions, when we take the derivative of a to the x, we get back uh, ln of a times a to the x. And when we take the derivative of e to the x, our derivative is simply e to the x. So those two things we know. So let's revisit now our logarithmic functions and think about what their derivatives can be because we know implicit differentiation. So let's come over here for just a second and let's consider, let's prove these. Let's consider y equals ln of x and y equals log of any base, base a of x. So let's consider those two things. And what if we wanted their derivatives? What would be the derivatives? What would be dy dx of these functions? Like instead of writing out derivatives, I'll write dy dx. So what would be dy dx of these functions? So how do we do that? So let's go ahead and do a little proof right here. So let's say let y equal the natural log of x where we will have a domain situation here right we can't we can't look at the natural log of x unless unless x is positive so we'll say where x is greater than 0 then it turns out that e to the y has to be equal to x just the just properties of logarithms and exponentials and the inverse uh, nature of those two functions. So just, uh, yeah, well, there's a few ways. You could just rewrite it, definition of the logarithm. Um, it is a power e to the y equals x, or you could just exponentiate, I guess, both sides. That's another way to think of it. Okay, so we know this, e to the y equals x. Now let's use implicit differentiation to find dy dx. So now let's just get in here and let's take dy dx of both sides, or uh, I'm sorry, d dx of both sides, e to the y. We will get a dy dx when we use chain rule and implicit differentiation over here. We've got x, take the derivative with respect to x on this side as well. That makes e to the y, the derivative of e to the y, we already know, is just e to the y, but because we're doing implicit differentiation and we're thinking of y, I mean, we know y actually up here, is a function of x. So we have to remember to apply chain rule and write dy dx. And then, of course, the derivative of x is just 1. So this is pretty simple uh, implicit dif uh, differentiation, but let's just keep it going. dy dx is 1 over e to the y. But e to the y is simply x. So this is simply 1 over x. So the derivative dy dx is simply 1 over x. We can even write it explicitly. So look at that. I mean, it's a pretty simple proof. It was an easy implicit uh, differentiation. And we have now shown that the derivative of the natural log of x when x is greater than 0 is 1 over x. So therefore, we could write it this way. We could even finish it out and say the derivative of the natural log of x is simply 1 over x when x is greater than 0. All right, we can actually extend that. We could throw some absolute values around the x, and we could, uh, we could do another proof with the absolute value and show that the absolute value, if we take the absolute value, then we could actually get rid of this piece right here and say that the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of x is actually equal to 1 over x um, as well. So we could even uh, clean up that um, situation with the domain by throwing an absolute value around the x. But I'm going to leave it like this, um, and I'm going to do the other proof because the other proof is really similar for the natural log not the natural log of, we've done the natural log of x, now let's do the log of any base. So let's do another little proof over here. And let's do another proof here. So let's say let, so it's going to look real similar. Let's just do this. Let y equal log base a of x, where, again, for domain reasons, we'll let x be greater than 0. Otherwise, this uh, logarithmic function is not defined, so x is greater than 0. And then let's just follow it through. So if y equals log base a of x, 
then a to the y is equal to x. Let's use implicit differentiation. Using implicit differentiation, we'll take the derivative with respect to x of both sides of that equation. Fill in our equation, a to the y and x. And the derivative of a to the y is a to the y times the natural log of a dy dx using the chain rule here and implicit differentiation because remember y is a function of x and this side of course is just one the derivative of x is just one now dy dx is actually one over a to the y times natural log of that base okay? that comes back from um, our derivatives of the exponentials a few sections back um, then we know there it is, a to the y is actually just x. So this is just equal to one over x times natural log of the base. Remembering that this piece here, of course, is just a constant. Okay. That's just a con constant natural log of whatever the base of the exponential we're looking at. And so there we go. Now we've proven in a similar way to what we did over here that the derivative of the natural, of the of log base any base, log base a of x, is 1 over x times that constant natural log of a. And so we could rewrite it this way if we want to. Therefore, the derivative of log, this is the formula we want to remember, log uh, base a of x is 1 over x times the natural log of that base a. When, and again, when x is greater than zero. We can, again, uh, just quick note, we could throw in these absolute values and then we don't need to have this piece here. Um, I'm not gonna write it that way. I'll put it over in my formal um, statement of these. We'll go ahead and just say, because what we've proved here is when x is greater than zero, but we could go through a proof for the absolute value as well. And there you have it. So there's our two derivatives. There they are. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and project the typed up version here, but those are our proofs. Um, pretty easy proofs, actually, with implicit differentiation. We can uh, find the derivatives of those logarithmic functions. And this expands a whole new um, section for us, a whole new set of derivatives that we can look at now because we haven't taken derivatives of the logarithms up to this point, and now we can. Um, so in this section, I'm going to revisit just our derivatives of our exponentials too, since exponentials and logarithms go hand in hand. So I've kind of thrown some of those into our examples that we're going to look at coming up um, just to remind us of our exponentials and our logarithms and, and all the rules that come from those. All right. So let's go um, pause. I'm going to jump back to the typed up version. Okay, so if you want to um, pause the video here and take all these down, here are the official definitions, the ones that we just proved um, earlier in the video, and here are the derivatives of our logarithm. So log of any base, when you take the derivative of log of any base, you're going to get 1 over x times the constant natural log of a. When you take the derivative of the natural log of x, you simply get 1 over x. Um, and you can see those. I did throw in the absolute values here as well um, because if you don't want to have that restriction on the domain where x has to be greater than zero, um, if you put an absolute value around it can be similarly proved um, just like we did in the proof that the log base a of the absolute value of x is equal to 1 over x natural log of a. Of course you ha do have to restrict x not equal to zero um, and then the natural log in a similar way. So there they are. So if you want to pause the video, take a minute, uh, make sure you get these down. Um, these are the derivatives of the logarithmic functions. Now, just because it's going to be, it's going to come up in our examples, um, we could combine these with the chain rule. And if you're taking the natural log of a function, natural log of g of x, then the result becomes 1 over g of x times g prime of x. And log base a, of course, of a function the derivative is going to be 1 over g of x times the constant natural log of a times g prime of x. So this is just combining the two rules, a generalization that pops up, because uh, often we're not taking just the natural log of x, we're taking the natural log of an entire function. Okay? Uh, Leibniz notation follows. Okay, let's do a couple examples. 
All right, so let's get started. Let's do a couple um, derivatives here, one with the natural log and one with the common log. Um, the, the second example has the common logs. So we'll talk about that in just a second. So let's take a look at this guy. Of course, this is product rule. So when I take the derivative here, let's do uh, Leibniz notation dy dx. I have to use the product rule. So I'm going to have 5 times x to the fourth times the natural log of x plus then the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x times x to the fifth. And then we'll just say, uh, simplify just a little bit and then take out a common factor. So we end up with um, 5x to the fourth natural log of x plus x to the fourth. And pulling out an x to the fourth, we get 5 natural log of x plus 1. And there's our derivative. Okay, just simply applying our new derivative rule for the natural log of x and our product rule from before. All right, let's do another one. Let's take this derivative. So f prime of x. Now this one, by the way, utilizes our um, different bases. So we've got base 5. And this guy, when it's not written, this is called the common log. So just a quick review. This is the common log. And the common log is base 10. So anytime you see log of x, that is really log base 10 of x. So there's the natural log and there's the common log. When we don't see a base written, it is base 10. Sometimes base 10 is written, um, but sometimes it's not. So I wanted to review that on this example. So when we're taking the derivative, again, it's a product rule. Maybe we should have done quotient here, but it's a product rule. So when I take the derivative, I'll have to apply my product rule. So I'll take the derivative of 5x. And the derivative of 5x is 5x times the natural log of 5. Then we multiply by g, which is just simply uh, the common log of x, plus, now we're going to take the derivative of the common log of x. So that's going to be 1 over x times natural log of the base. And so this is where we need to remember that common log is base 10. So that's 1 over x um, times ln of 10 times 5 to the x. Now, I don't know. Let's see here if there's much to simplify. Maybe we go ahead and pull out that 5 to the x, and we'll have natural log of 5 times log of x plus 1 over x times natural log of 10. And there is our second derivative. Simplified uh, slightly, not a whole lot to simplify there. OK, let's do a couple more. All right, so let's take a look at this function. So we've got g of x equals the natural log of x squared minus x minus 6. And, oh, I should have said find the derivative. Find the derivative of this function and find the domain of g of x. So how do we find the domain of g of x? Let's, um, well, well, we can take the derivative in just a second. Let's actually start with this part. How do we find the domain of g of x? Well, the domain, that's just going back to a pre-calculus question. The domain of a natural log function, this piece, the argument, whatever we plug into the natural log has to be greater than 0. So the domain of g of x, so a little review on that. So to find the domain of g of x, we have to take whatever the argument is whatever we're taking the logarithm of, the function that has been composed into the logarithm, and we have to guarantee that that is greater than 0. Otherwise, the logarithm is not defined. So x squared minus x minus 6, well, that's a polynomial. When is that greater than 0? Well, a few ways to do it. You could do a graphical approach. I'm going to do an algebraic approach. Uh, we're just going to factor it. So that's going to be x minus 3 and x plus 2, which gives me two roots, two zeros at uh, 3 and negative 2. So let's look at 3 and negative 2. Let's look at our breakpoints, or zeros. Let's call them zeros. So where would that actually be equal to 0? We're trying to figure out where it's greater than 0, but where would it actually equal 0? Those are places uh, where it could change. So let's take a look at negative 2. Go to our number line, negative 2 and 3. This would be our number line, our x value. Our x 
axis. So we've got negative two and three, and then we're just gonna test some points on these intervals. So we've got the interval here from negative infinity to negative two, negative two to three, and from three to infinity. And I'm just gonna pick a test point. So, you know, for instance, if I were to pick something like negative five, and I plug negative five into this. If I plug negative five in, I get negative five minus three, so I would end up with a negative value, and negative five plus two, I also end up with a negative value, but a negative times a negative is a positive. So what that means is that all the points on this interval will be positive, greater than zero. Remember, positive is greater than zero. Uh, if I pick something here, and the obvious one to pick here would be zero, and I plug that in to my inequality here to see if it's true or false, right? If, and I'm just doing signs. I'm not even worried really about the numbers. So if I plug in zero, I get a negative three, negative value, and I plug in zero to this factor, and I get positive two. So negative times a positive, and that is a negative, which is not, right? That's less than zero. That is not uh, greater than zero. So I, none of those values, that interval is not going to work. And I do the same thing here. I don't know. Let's do positive five. If I pick positive five, I get a positive and a positive. A positive times a positive is in fact positive, which is greater than zero. So all these points on this interval will work as well. Now the actual zeros, remember this is a strict inequality. We have to be greater than zero. So those values cannot be included. So these are open intervals from negative two to negative, uh, from negative infinity to negative two, and from three to infinity. Open intervals at negative two and at three. So the domain, so to answer the domain question, the domain of g of x, the values for x for which this argument of the natural log are positive, they're gonna be from negative infinity to negative two, and a union from three to infinity. So our domain has been found. So those are the values for x which will um, be acceptable values to plug into this function. Okay, so that's the domain. That was actually just a pre-calculus review. That wasn't even any calculus. So now let's take the derivative. So let's come back here and let's actually find g prime of x. So this is where we have to apply the chain rule. And since this piece that I have underlined is my inner function, the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x. So the derivative is going to be 1 over x squared minus x minus 6 times, and then chain rule, the derivative of x squared minus x minus 6. We have to take the derivative of the inside. So my derivative, normally we would jump right to this, is going to be 1 over x squared minus x minus 6 times, well, the derivative of x squared minus x minus 6 is 2x minus 1. And therefore, my derivative, g prime of x, is 2x minus 1 over x squared minus x minus 6. And that is the derivative of this function. All right, so we've got the derivative and the domain.